In the 1890s, it was decided that solitary confinement was so damaging to prisoners that it was decided to discontinue the use of it. However, in 2017, we're seeing solitary confinement having come back and in a big way. My name is Lee Rawls of the ABA Journal. This is the Modern Law Library, and today my guest is Kara Ryder, the author of 23-7, Pelican Bay Prison and the Rise of Long-Term Solitary Confinement. Karamet, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Lee. So just to start off with, before reading your book, I had never heard of Pelican Bay Prison. You hear a lot of the famous names, Alcatraz or Rikers, but Pelican Bay was not familiar to me, and there is kind of a reason why. Can you explain how Pelican Bay came about and what its purpose is? Sure. So uh, Pelican Bay is a long-term high-security prison that opened in California in 1989. And it was designed to keep prisoners in solitary confinement basically indefinitely, for months if not years at a time. And the reason no one really knows about it is actually kind of interesting. When it first opened, there was a little bit of attention to it. But part of the story of my book is about how hidden institutions like Pelican Bay have been in the United States Um, both in terms of how they're designed and the way they were initially funded and opened, and then subsequently in terms of how they're operated and the kinds of discretion that governs the policies and procedures in these institutions. So when Pelican Bay opened in 1989, it had been designed by prison officials, basically, and it was part of a massive prison building project in California. The state built um, more than 20 prisons over the course of the 1980s and 1990s. And to a lot of people, Pelican Bay just seemed like one of those prisons. And because they were building prisons, because the state was building prisons so fast, legislators delegated a lot of authority to prison officials about exactly what kinds of prisons they designed. So it wasn't until Pelican Bay opened and prisoners there started sending letters out to lawyers and judges in the state complaining about just how harsh and restrictive the conditions were. It was when those letters started to reach judges and lawyers that people started to ask what kind of prison had been built up on California's northernmost border with Oregon in the Redwoods in a very rural place. Karamet, how did you become interested in the topic of long-term solitary confinement and indeed in just prison studies in general? Well, I started teaching in prison in college. Uh, I was interested in education. I had some friends who were teaching in prison. It sounded like a interesting, exotic thing to do at the time. Uh, I was kind of curious about what it would be like. And I started teaching in a jail in Boston and also in a juvenile detention facility there doing GED work, essentially, so helping prisoners pass their high school equivalency exams through tutoring. And it was through that process that I got really interested in our prisons. I kept meeting really interesting people who had had really tough lives Um, and who were facing incredibly harsh sentences. And I got increasingly curious about how that system came about. And through that work, kind of stayed involved in prison advocacy. And I actually started doing work on solitary confinement in Massachusetts in the late 1990s, early 2000s, before it was really on the national radar. So I came at it from that perspective of education. Um, I did work on prison litigation and prisoners' rights for a few years. And in the process of doing that work, I kept being surprised at how little we knew about our prisons. So um, I worked for Human Rights Watch for two years and worked there on a report on juvenile life without parole in the U.S. And this is just one example of so many in prison research. Before we could even write that report, we had to do incredible data collection to figure out how many kids had been sentenced to life without parole in the United States. Um, because that wasn't data that had been collected. That kind of motivated me more, pushed me more and more towards doing research on these issues instead of advocacy, because it felt to me so often like we didn't have the basic data we needed as advocates to even make recommendations about what to do. Given that kind of background, solitary confinement to me and and the work I'd done even in college was a kind of obvious place to start because it it was, you know, people call it the prison within a prison. It's kind of the most hidden aspect of incarceration in the U.S. And so it was a place where I was especially curious to do some research and and figure out if more data could help us think differently about policy. Um, I was in California for graduate school, and I knew about Pelican Bay as someone who did prison work in the state. And Pelican Bay was one of the first and is still one of the largest supermaxes ever built in the U.S., so it was an, a really interesting place to think about the, these questions about how long-term solitary confinement came about in the 1980s and 90s. 
Now, we've seen various, you know, media and movie portrayals of solitary confinement. I'm thinking of the Shawshank Redemption, Mm -hmm. where Andy Dufresne is locked in a pitch black room for a month. What is solitary confinement like for a prisoner in actuality? Mm. So, yeah, there there have been many media portrayals lately. There's also Piper Kernan in Orange is the New Black, just to jog people's memories. But but one of the things I often say about those movie portrayals is it's hard to capture the utter extremity of the deprivation and the length of time people spend in these places and how hard it is to not know how long you'll be there. So, you know, it's one thing to see a visual image of it in a movie, and I certainly show images when I when I give public talks on this, but it's another thing to stop and imagine what it means to spend 23 or more hours a day in a concrete box that's 8 by 10 feet. So imagine a wheelchair-accessible bathroom stall or a parking space that has fluorescent lights that are on 24 hours a day, usually no natural light. Pelican Bay has no windows in the prisoner's cells. And there's a toilet and a sink steel combination and a cement ledge for, for a bed. And that's where you live. If you're lucky, you get to go out to an exercise yard, which is often colloquially called a dog run, or to a shower, maybe two or three times a week. And the rest of the time you're in that cement box, if you behave, you can usually have a TV or a radio, but you wouldn't be allowed any human contact. So if a family member was able to come visit you, which places like Pelican Bay are incredibly rural, Pelican Bay is a good 12-hour drive from Los Angeles, where most of the prisoners are from, um, if your family was able to come visit you, it would, the visit would happen for an hour behind bulletproof glass. Um, if you needed to see a doctor or uh, access legal documents, you might be put in a kind of cage on wheels. And so even then, you would have very limited human contact. And we're talking about people experiencing these conditions, not for a few weeks or months, but for years at a time. In California, uh, as of 2015, before some major litigation in the state, There were 500 prisoners who'd been in continuous isolation for more than 10 years at Pelican Bay. When you think about human psychology, they talk about how how important touch is and to gaze upon another human being and have that human being gaze upon you. And it seems like both of those are almost completely removed. And honestly, I find the idea of continuous fluorescent light and no window and no darkness. And one of the things I found chilling was you cannot have a clock yes. inside your cell. You yes. do not know how time is passing. Like, you're totally removed from that. That was one of the things I found most horrifying and striking. Yeah, it's, it's very disorienting. <laughs> very disorienting. What do we know about the psychological effects of this long-term solitary confinement? Have there been studies? Do we have data? Have. And we're in the process of getting more data. One thing I often say about this is that the U.S. has basically been engaged in a mass experiment since the late 1980s when we started opening these facilities of keeping this many people in this kind of extremely restrictive conditions of confinement for this long. And so we're just beginning to understand what the impacts are of this kind of confinement. Now, even before we started doing this, there was good research around, just psychological research around sensory deprivation and what its effects are. A lot of it was done around uh, military training in the 50s and 60s to see what prisoners of war uh, might withstand or might experience. And there, the studies are fairly robust, showing that after even a few hours of sensory deprivation, so people might be put in a dark room with gloves on, uh, that kind of, you know, or with a blindfold on, this, this kind of thing. Um, that after a few hours like that, people can start to experience hallucinations, anxiety attacks, heart palpitations, and that many people who participate in these experiments ask to quit the experiment after after a few hours because it, it can be so hard to endure. So there's that kind of piece of data, and there's, I mean, there's, there's in Remedley, the Supreme Court case you mentioned from the 1890s, where there was evidence when solitary confinement was used in early prisons in the U.S. that people went crazy. There is starting to be good data that rates of suicide and suicide attempt are significantly higher in isolation units than they are in general populations in the prison. And that's, that's accounting for the fact that in general, um, our prisons tend to have more mentally ill people than the general prison population. Rates of mental illness in isolation tend to be 50% or higher of the, of the population. Now, there's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, are people ending up there because they were seriously mentally ill in the first place, or are they becoming mentally ill while they're there? 
that can be hard to tease apart. In litigation around these conditions, the experts who've been brought in in the litigation have systematically documented, again, the kinds of mental health problems people experience in these conditions of confinement. So in the early 90s, the term shoe syndrome was coined to talk about what people at places like Pelican Bay were experiencing. So that unit is called the security housing unit, or SHU. Um, And SHU syndrome is the constellation of symptoms, including anxiety attacks, trouble sleeping, uh, sometimes fits of rage, hallucinating, uh, and all kinds of physical symptoms, too. So I think I mentioned heart palpitations. Um, So those things have been documented, but mostly in the context of litigation. And there has not been, you know, it's hard to sort of match groups of people and do systematic uh, randomized control trials on on this kind of confinement. Um, So there are some criticisms that a lot of the research has been done in the context of litigation. Recently, actually, uh, in California, around the most recent litigation about those prisoners who'd been in isolation for more than 10 years, a new round of data was collected from neuroscientists suggesting that the physical shape of the brain actually changes with reduced human contact and sensory stimulation, um, that the, the kind of brainstem shape can change and your, you know, your ability to reason through certain things can change. So one of the things I liked about your book was that you were able to track down and speak with some people who had been in this kind of confinement and who were later paroled. It really put a good human face Mm -hmm. on this. And we're told, oh, Supermax, that's for the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. And you sort of break down that phrase uh, throughout the book and ask kind of pertinent questions such as, if this is the worst of the worst, how can you be paroled straight from solitary confinement to the streets? Mm -hmm. And you actually spoke to a man named Ernie, Mm -hmm. um, who that happened to. Could you talk a little bit about Ernie, just so our listeners get an idea about just one person's experience. Sure. Ernie, Ernie, I think there, there are a handful of really powerful stories that stood out to me in the course of doing this research, and, and Ernie's was certainly one of them. He went to prison on a, one of the first convictions for a third strike after California passed that law. So he you know, committed a, a relatively nonviolent crime. I don't even remember. I think it, maybe he had some drugs on him, and it was his third strike. I, I think he was older. And he didn't even realize that the felony he'd committed was eligible for a third strike, but he was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. That was that was what the three strikes law called for in California at the time. And then uh, a few years ago, the state passed reforms to those laws and found that people who had a third felony that was nonviolent, like Ernie's, should have their sentence reconsidered and possibly be released from prison. And Ernie was ordered released. Now, the interesting backstory is that he'd been validated a gang member and sent to isolation at Pelican Bay shortly after he got to prison, and he'd been there for years. And so when the judge ordered him released, he was released directly from Pelican Bay. Uh, And the judge, you know, in ordering his release, suggested that perhaps he didn't think he belonged in Pelican Bay in the first place. And indeed, you know, according to Ernie, it had been a mistake and a misunderstanding that he'd ever been labeled a gang member and sent there in the first place, I think. The first six years he was there was based on a drawing, and the second was based on someone's name that had been found in a book in his cell that had been passed to him. So really, that gives you a sense of the kind of loose type of evidence that could get someone labeled a gang member in California and then sent to isolation indefinitely, like Ernie was. So he was, as you can imagine, kind of shocked and relieved to find out that his sentence had been essentially commuted Um, And he was released directly from isolation. He's incredibly eloquent, and I I quote him at length in the book, talking about the experience of the officers at Pelican Bay who hadn't seen him or been near him without cuffs on his hands, with his hands cuffed to his waist and his feet cuffed. They get the, the notice that he's to be released, and they come and remove all the shackles and put him on a bus and drop him at a bus station about an hour from the prison, Um, And, you know, he talks about just the, everybody's, you know, he's awkward. He hasn't been able to freely move his hands in free air or seen natural light in over a decade. And officers are awkward because this guy that they've been keeping completely isolated for years is now able to move about freely without chains on. It sort of gives you a sense of how illogical these policies are, not just that, you know, there's questions about whether Ernie ever belonged there in the first place, but then imagining what it's like to just release someone from those incredibly restrictive conditions straight back onto the street. And then you can imagine, I mean, Ernie describes just, he hadn't seen a cell phone, um, 
everything. I mean, we met in a McDonald's and he, there was a touch screen to get your soda to dispense and he'd never seen a screen like that. I, I mean, everything in the world that he encountered was novel and sensory overload, essentially. So you talked about the prison guards and Ernie in that moment, and pretty much everyone in the room is feeling anxiety. Mm. In order to do their jobs, it seems to be in the book, you, you spoke to a lot of correctional facility managers and prison officials and prison guards. You know, they fear these prisoners and they, you know, put these harsh restrictions on them, which seems to backfire in, in many cases. You talked about how, you know, in the 1980s, this sort of started, this long-term solitary confinement. What happened in the couple of decades leading up to that that led to this sea change in correctional facilities? So, and I, I really appreciate how you, you focus on the fear that correctional officers experience, because that was something it took me a long time to come to appreciate. But I think they really do... You know, whether we on the outside can see that maybe Ernie never should have ended up in isolation, I think there's a dynamic in isolation where officers are genuinely afraid of these prisoners that they're managing, and and they don't have the tools to tell who's truly dangerous and who's not often. And that fear, it turns out, dates back to way before Pelican Bay opened in 1989. And this was one of the surprises to me in doing this research, was kind of coming to understand that and get that deeper backstory. And it dates back to the 1970s. There were intense moments of violence in many state prisons across the U.S. In California, the story that prison officials kept pointing me to was the story of George Jackson. Um, George Jackson, (laughs) interestingly, not unlike Ernie, went to prison on a relatively nonviolent, I think he committed a, a minor burglary prison sentence. And he was sentenced to one year to life, which was fairly common in the 1960s, an indeterminate sentence. And the idea was prisoners would prove that they had been rehabilitated by behaving, and then whenever that happened, whether it was a year or two or ten, uh, prison officials and parole boards would then be able to release them. So it was kind of a way to ensure people were rehabilitated before they came out. That kind of sentencing faced a lot of critique in, in the 60s and 70s, but George Jackson was one of those people who had trouble proving he was rehabilitated and got in more and more trouble in prison. He was accused of killing a prison officer, and he was preemptively sent to death row at San Quentin while he was awaiting trial for the officer's death. And while there, the story that gets told by prison officials in California is that his lawyer smuggled a gun into him inside a tape recorder, and Jackson used that gun to escape from the isolation unit on death row, um, ran out onto the prison yard. A gun and a wig. A gun and a wig, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> I, I read. I read that part of your book, and it said, you know, the lawyer had a tape recorder, and inside it was a gun and a wig. Mm-hmm. And I thought, how big is this tape recorder? I know the 1970s, you know, or a while ago, but how big is this tape recorder? And <laughs> That's exactly there were a lot of I, details I, that, looking back, don't seem to line up. Exactly. When I talk about this, I often say now, you know, tape recorders were big in the 70s, but not quite that big. Um, So yes, it is a little bit of an apocryphal story, but it's one that's been told and retold. And and there's no question that Jackson was able to run out of the isolation unit on death row and that he was shot and died on the prison yard at San Quentin. And when prison officials went back into the cell, they found that two prisoners and three officers had been stabbed to death. That was the deadliest day in California prison history ever. It was August 21st, 1971. And anyone who works in the California prisons can tell you that was a Sunday, and they remember the date and the time, because it has such power and has created such a sense of fear in the institution. The story is important for all kinds of reasons. One, it's amazing that we still don't know exactly what happened, how Jackson was able to get out of the isolation unit on death row since the gun was never found and the story about it being smuggled in doesn't make sense. But clearly something was happening uh, in the institution. And Jackson, of course, I should have said, had become very famous at this point. He had published a book of letters to family members and his lawyers that became an instantly acclaimed national and international bestseller. So he he was already putting a lot of pressure on the system as a critic of it who was challenging it from within. So there were certainly people who, you know, whose lives <laughs> would be easier if Jackson were silenced. And so that's the kind of counter story is, you know, was he trying to escape or was someone trying to set him up? And then to counterbalance that story, we, you know, we don't know. And you ask yourself, well, if this was just a setup, how did three guards and two white prisoners end up dead in his cell. 
right. would, you know, why would why would the guards have been killed if this was just a, you know, prison managed exactly. setup? And so it's it's just a very murky origin story to have resulted in these massive policy shifts for tens of thousands of people. Exactly. And so George Jackson and that moment of incredible violence and fear is what prison officials point to as the reason why they needed a supermax like Pelican Bay with 1,056 long-term isolation beds. And indeed, many of the prisoners who were uh, accused of being involved with helping Jackson to escape were immediately locked down into kind of precursors of isolation units at San Quentin. And the one prisoner whose conviction for participating was never overturned. They had a really hard time prosecuting people for their involvement in Jackson's case. But but one prisoner remained in prison and was never able to fully fight the charge. And he was one of the first guys transferred to Pelican Bay and was there until the reforms that required people who'd been there more than 10 years to be moved out. So that's just to show there's this kind of continuity. And it's not just California. What's important about this story is that these kinds of moments happened in facilities across the U.S. In fact, two weeks after George Jackson died, the uh, uprising at Attica happened, and that resulted in the same kind of backlash of prisoners being locked into isolation units and ultimately long-term isolation facilities being built to institutionalize that. Um, It happened in New Mexico after a massive riot there a few years later, so it's a story that repeated itself across the United States. Now, there have been, as you pointed out, reform movements before this that looked at, you know, after these supermax prisons arose, the kinds of things that were happening inside them. And some were really terrible constitutional violations. Um, You mentioned a man named uh, Von Dorch, Mm -hmm. who seemed to be very mentally ill. He had smeared himself with feces, and the guards held him in such hot water that he had third-degree burns and his skin fell off. Just awful thing, gladiator fights. Mm -hmm. But one of the other things I found interesting was in these reform movements, there did seem to be unintended consequences But also, you pointed out, you know, unintended consequences did happen, but there was also this, you called it administrative retrenchment. Can Mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the first wave of reform efforts and why they did not exactly achieve what we hoped they would achieve? Mm -hmm. And there, I mean, so you're thinking of sort of what happened immediately after Von Dorch and the gladiator fights? Yeah, um, Yeah. I'm thinking one of the things that stuck out to me in the subtitles was the menace of good intentions. Mm -hmm. And I I found the story very affecting of uh, Robert Martinson, who was another prison scholar and had completed a study of existing rehabilitation programs and found that the existing rehabilitation programs were not effective at stopping recidivism. And suddenly his research was used to promote ideas that he did not support. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. as a prison scholar, you know, do you worry that your own work could end up like Robert Martinson's as used to support things that you never intended? Certainly. And were not supported by your studies. And I asked which one because there's so, I mean, this is kind of a cyclical narrative of the book that there are these moments of reform. So there's the, the moment of reform with Robert Martinson in the 70s And then there's another moment of reform in the early 90s after Pelican Bay opens. And one of the arguments is that there's a kind of pattern to these reforms that's, you know, it's a little bit of a cynical story and a little bit of a sad story, but that there are these moments when people are paying close attention to the prisons and often especially to to harsh conditions in prisons. Um, So that certainly was happening in the 1970s around the time George Jackson died. Um, And it was happening in the early 1990s when Pelican Bay first opened. And it is happening again now. And so I think it's especially important to think about whether there are lessons to learn from the past. And so one of the things I talk about is that sometimes people tell those stories as a story of unintended consequences. So, um, you know, we tried in the 1970s, we shifted away from that indeterminate sentence I mentioned, in part because the criticism of it was that it had a racially disproportionate impact, especially on African-American prisoners like George Jackson, um, who had a harder time proving they'd been rehabilitated. And the idea was if, if we made fixed sentences, they would be more equal and less discriminatory. And so we moved to determinate sentencing. And the story that's often told about that is that um, liberals and conservatives agreed that the sentencing shift was good, but then determinate sentencing in the end produced much longer and harsher prison sentences than anyone had ever imagined when they started advocating for reform. 
And part of what I say in the book is, you know, the story is a little more complicated than that. The story is one of people paying attention to some pieces of reform and not others, and especially not paying enough attention to what the reforms mean for people working in these prison facilities. And so when that shift from indeterminate to determinate sentencing happened, Prison officials working in prisons in states like California were really worried that they were losing control over the prison population because they would no longer be able to threaten them with longer prison sentences if they misbehaved. And so solitary confinement became another tool to replace that. So rather than thinking of it as an unintended consequences, I think it's important to also understand that it's a story of prison officials having significant control and discretion over how prisons run and working very successfully to maintain that control and discretion in the face of reforms. And so that's a little more complicated. And I, and I think that's what we saw again when there were attempts to reform prisons through litigation. Uh, in the 1970s and again in the 1990s, there was a big lawsuit, Madrid v. Gomez, in California as soon as Pelican Bay opened, challenging the conditions of confinement there. And one of the things I say about that litigation is that, again, prison officials were able to control the narrative about why the institution was necessary, and that really limited the impact of the litigation to find that there were kind of reforms around the edges. Certainly, the judge ordered better training and medical care to make sure that the kinds of abuses like the case of Von Dorch that you described didn't happen anymore. But Judge Henderson, who oversaw that case, who's an incredibly liberal, well-respected judge, found that long-term solitary confinement was not per se unconstitutional, as long as people had adequate medical care and the staff were trained and weren't beating prisoners up. Um, and so again, that's a case of it being hard to implement reform, especially when there's debates over exactly whether the institutions are needed or not. And, and the important backstory to that litigation, too, is that there had been litigation over the course of the 70s and 80s across the United States about conditions of confinement. And there was consensus that if prisoners were put in isolation, they needed to have things like adequate lighting, uh, running water in their cells, um, cells that were hygienic and could be easily cleaned. And it turns out Pelican Bay looks a lot like that. The lights are on 24 hours a day. The cement is incredibly easy to hose down when it gets dirty. Um, there's running water. Every prisoner has a sink and a toilet in their cell. Um, in general, my, they're not overcrowded. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. But no, no. One of my favorite things that one of the prison architects said, or I don't know if he was an architect, but one of the prison officials said was, it's not draconian, it's Spartan. <laughs> exactly. And I think, well, if you do look back to the actual historical Spartans, that that's pretty accurate, but the Spartans were terrible. <laughs> right. Just terrible. <laughs> right. And it is all in the interpretation, right? So, so I guess I mean that that was a long-winded, but there are many there are many pieces of reform. I think you know of the ways in which people running prisons have been very successful at maintaining their control over those institutions in the face of reform. And my hope is that by understanding a little better all the different ways that has happened over time we might be able to think about better tools of oversight and better conversations with prison officials about what they need to feel safe in running their institutions. So there does seem to be sort of a bipartisan push at the moment to enact criminal justice reform. And part of it is examining what's going on in prison, overcrowding in prison. There was a recent Marshall Project report about double bunking in solitary, which yep. sounds very counterintuitive. And what do you mean? Two people in <laughs> solitary? Then it's not solitary. But if you were asked, what are the first steps we need to take in order to reform the current system? What would you tell legislators who are interested in doing that? So the very first step, I think, is sometimes counterintuitive to people because the conditions are so abusive. I think there's an instinct to say, let's get rid of this as quickly as we can, or let's get as many people out as we can. And I think those are important steps in the reform process. But I think the very first step is oversight and transparency. And my argument for that is in part that these moments of reform come about when people get a glimpse inside these facilities and have an understanding of what's happening there. And it takes that insight to even begin to have the conversation about what's possible. And so I think the hunger strikes in California are, are a perfect example of that, where no one was really paying attention to solitary confinement in California, let alone in the United States. 
until 2013 when more than 30,000 prisoners refused food for weeks at a time in order to protest the conditions specifically at Pelican Bay. And that drew national and international attention and really started an important reform conversation because for the first time people got a glimpse inside those facilities. It was around those hunger strikes that the Department of Corrections released snapshot data for the first time saying there were 500 prisoners who'd been at Pelican Bay for more than 10 years. And those 500 prisoners were very quickly certified as a class of prisoners as soon as that data was out there. And so one of my arguments is, you know, in order to even mobilize people to think about what's going on in these facilities, we need to, A, be paying close attention to them, see what's happening there, and, B, we need to have the data to understand who's there, how they ended up there, and to be able to make really reasoned decisions about what would work better. And then, you know, we can move forward with, I think there's widespread consensus now that these kinds of conditions of confinement have been overused, both in terms of the number of people who end up there and the length of time people spend there. But again, you know, having a really specific sense of why people are there and how long they've been there is key to beginning to make targeted reforms that make sense of changing those policies. Well, Karamit, thank you so much for joining us. For our readers, Karamit's book is 237 Pelican Bay Prison and the Rise of Long-Term Solitary Confinement. And uh, it's also available on audiobook. I downloaded that. Karamit, if people were interested in not only reading your book, but finding out more from you or how to get in contact with you, how would they go about that? I have a website. Um, well, my name is very easy to Google. <laughs> but there is a website. Um, it's just my name, karamitwriter.com, that has some links to details about the book and then also my faculty webpage at the University of California, Irvine, where I'm a professor, has links to a lot more of my writing if you're interested in more of the kind of academic framing of some of these questions. And for those who are listening, Karamit's name is K-E-R-A-M-E-T-R-E-I-T-E-R. Uh, and Karamit, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks so much for having me, Lee, and for taking the time to read the book. Oh, absolutely. And to our listeners of the Modern Law Library, please rate and subscribe via iTunes. Thanks so much for listening.